Okay. Am I loud enough for everyone? Okay. Uh, I'll probably get louder as we go. Uh, so, uh, this is Growing Community, Learning from Mistakes. I am LB Denker. I work at Etsy. Uh, Etsy is a uh, pretty cool place. Uh, how many people have heard of Etsy? Wow, all of you. That's pretty cool. It's funny. Uh, one of the things I love about Etsy is that there's usually only two reactions to it. It's, what's Etsy? Or it's, oh my god, you work at Etsy! And then I'm like in a confined elevator freaking out for my life. But <laughs> Etsy's a pretty cool place. It's, a, it's an online bazaar for uh, handmade goods, but we also have vintage goods, which is, uh, you know, if you got those uh, placemats from 20 years ago, you could actually sell those. Um, anybody remember the little plastic place mess that your mom had that she could easily wipe off whenever you got your spaghetti all over the place? Uh, we're a decently sized site. I mean, I know we're here, you know, talking about startups and stuff. We still consider ourselves a startup, but we're kind of like in the teenage years of startup <laughs> in a way where we're like, yeah, we're big. We can do awesome things, but it's like, no, you're still not. We're still not that corporate, which is kind of cool. Um, for Etsy, I just wanted to share some of the things I've purchased on Etsy. I love Etsy. So uh, my first purchase was back in 2006, back when the search on the site sucked. Absolutely <laughs> sucked. And it was, it was just starting up. And uh, it was Lego Pirate Map Cufflinks. Uh, my husband, who uh, was a computer science student around the time I was, uh, was that douchebag nerd that would uh, wear a suit on Fridays. He would do formal Fridays to class. Like, what nerd does that? And so cufflinks would match a person who loves Legos and Transformers. Uh, sometime you should see pictures of my house to see how many toys I have, and then ask how many children I have, and I'll tell you, my husband. Uh, then soon after, I uh, soon after I thought about joining Etsy, I was looking at wedding and I was like, a wedding dress. Wouldn't it be cool to have one that's handmade rather than you know just going to David's bridal and picking one up? And uh, the unicorn one, I mean. Uh, Etsy, what do you think is the biggest holiday at Etsy? Like Halloween, yes, that is the biggest holiday. And if you're not making your costume, shame on you. You gotta put your costume together. So, just a couple things there. So, Etsy, not only is it just these storefronts, but it's also about community. It's also about storytelling. Um, when the site was first created, it was created by some guy that was a carpenter. He wasn't a technologist by any means. He didn't mind toying around with it, but he was a carpenter and like, wait, where am I gonna sell my stuff? Like, who's going to buy my carpentry? Everybody goes to the Raymore and Flanagan's and picks up the same old dresser. So he had this idea of, what if I made a site that could put a storefront there, but then gave storefronts to everyone so that everybody could look for a variety of things that people make. The other thing that was interesting when I first joined Etsy is we have uh, orientation, and he was there talking about uh, what he thought the most important thing about Etsy was. And that was the idea of connecting the buyer with the person who actually made the thing. Not just the seller, not like going to JCPenney's and being like, oh yeah, I go to the big box store and I get stuff. But actually knowing who made your shoes, where did they source the materials from, uh, is there a story behind it? And one of the things I've even loved about Etsy is just you know getting into a conversation with a seller and being like, you know, I see you make this like cloth lunch bag set, but I also see that you can have Transformers cloth. Can I get that as a set with the Transformers cloth? And them going like, hell yeah, I'm totally going to do that for you. Um, the other thing with Etsy is uh, the way that we break up the company is it's 40-20-40. So 40% 40 is engineering, 40% is support, and 20% is something else. And support is kind of a big thing at Etsy because that involves the community, having events. We have Etsy Labs on Monday evenings where people can come in and learn a craft. And if you can't make it to Brooklyn, go on the website and watch what the craft is and learn about it. 
Uh, they form teams. Uh, I did the little search for what are the Cincinnati teams that we have. And as you can see, 182 members, 135 members for two of the top Cincinnati teams that exist. And what is the significance of teams? It's the idea that as you work with other people, you can make something bigger. So even though someone might be a knitter and somebody might be a woodworker, and you might be like, well, what does that have to do with anything? One of you is going to have successes in certain areas, and one of you is going to have success in other areas. And if you get together, you'll be able to share how did you market things, um, who were you working with. Maybe the knitter could actually make something to go along with your woodworking. You never know. And teams just form a bigger thing. So anyways, why am I talking all about this? Well, I'm going to get into more of the engineering, because well, I live in engineering land, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Chad Dickerson, our current CEO, said the most important component of the Etsy way, he has an entire blog post about what the Etsy way is, is culture. And that is difficult to teach as it is important. Community and culture kind of go you know, hand in hand. Uh, what community you're raised in kind of dictates what culture you learn. And we have an interesting culture, and I'm going to go over some of the mistakes that we have gone through as we are trying to build our culture um, and build community within our company. But I have the disclaimer that I wasn't around for everything. So I made some of it up. <laughs> so anyways, 2005, June 2005, founder comes up with this idea. He pulls together a web developer, somebody who knows databases because how are you going to have inventory? How are you going to get something on a site? Right? Got to start somewhere. 2007, you know, people start actually noticing this and we start, you know, getting a lot more traffic. So how are we going to get the site that just a couple people that really didn't even know what they were doing at the time to actually handle that much traffic and stay up? Well, the original engineering breakdown was we had our devs, we had our DBAs, and we had our ops. It was a pretty well-defined role. The developers write the code, the DBAs write the SQL, and the ops, they deploy the code and maintain production. And who knows Conway's law? Any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Well, we developed a piece of infrastructure called Sprouter. Because the DBAs, they write the SQL, they know the stored procedures, and the developers, they don't even know this stuff. So this is kind of on the path to our sort of first mistake. We had this rigid structure, we created a bunch of silos, and this really isn't much of a community. Our stored procedure router was completely set up so the DBAs could own the database. They could dictate everything and make the developers have to go through a very thin interface. It sounded like a good idea at the time. So like if you've developed code and you know about you know, having nice sturdy contracts, it sounds good because it gives you that layer to go and pivot and change things underneath. And it sounds awesome. But unfortunately, it really just made us quarrel with each other because the developers couldn't have enough control over what to put into storage, and the DBAs thought that was a perfect idea. And so it was kind of a war zone, and it was kind of sad. And so it wasn't too long, but we spent a year working on this Sprouter thing, creating these silos, and we spent two years getting rid of it and fixing our situation. And so what changed? We finally realized that we were going to get a lot better work done if we actually had a DevOps relationship. How many people have heard the whole DevOps term? How many think it's a role? Yeah, it's a relationship. DevOps is a relationship. It's not a role. It's because you still have people that have certain um, expertise. and. I include product in here, but I you know, kind of have it like outlined because it's kind of a step that DevOps hasn't fully incorporated into the entire thing. 
you know, but at the same time, everybody needs to work together because we want to create a product that is good and has multiple perspectives. So the next thing that we had, even though we have decided we're not going to segregate people, operations could contribute to development, developers can contribute to operations, that's all good. We then moved on to the next point of growing a workforce. So eventually, you know, your little company, you know, hopefully gets enough traffic, uh, you're making enough money, and you're like, we could implement so much more if we just had more people working on this. And so you're going to get more people. 2005, you know, we had the founder, the DBA, two developers, it was one, and then they got, you know, featured on Boing Boing in August 2005 and had to get a second one. 2007, we had that whole developers, DBAs, ops, silos, and 10 to 15 engineers, which is pretty easy because, I mean, three to five engineers on a team, you've probably heard the ballpark term of five to seven people per team. That usually seems uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, I was walking, uh, is anybody a graph theory nerd around here? Anybody know what a complete graph is? The idea that if you have a bunch of nodes and if they all connect, that is a complete graph. Well, if you draw out these graphs on one, two, three, and four nodes, there's no overlapping. But once you hit five, there's overlapping. And if you make that analogous to like communication, you're stepping on each other's toes as soon as you get uh, the lines overlapping. So part of me thinks that is where it sort of comes from. Once you get to five people, it gets very hard to communicate ideas and include everyone. Uh oh. So 2009, this was after 2008. We decided we're getting rid of the sprouter. We decided we're done with all the silos. We want it to be one big happy family. And we want to keep growing the site and getting more people. And we kept increasing the number of people we had from 15 to 30 to 60 engineers. Can you divide 60 people into just three teams and have it all work out? Probably not. 20 people is kind of hard to corral. So how do we organize all of this? So we had some ops guys, and it was pretty you know, reasonable to be like, well, those ops guys, they have expertise in hardware. So we'll let them be on a team. We acquired a, a company called Intuitive that was into search and ads. And so they were five people because, I mean, most search stacks are on solar. That's Java. So kind of makes sense. Our site, PHP for the most part. So what do we do with everybody else? A lot of organizations will go into, well, I'll have my front end, I'll have my back end. If you have an API layer, maybe you'll put that out. Um, and that's so-so. Because -so. Uh, once you were at 50 people, that's still too big of teams. So then we started looking at storefronts, content and community, international, like looking at individual features being their own separate teams. Of course, we went back to having our silos again for very weird reasons. We ended up putting things in separate repos. People started doing separate technologies for things. And it's not that it's bad to explore lots of different technologies. But in one cohesive project, it gets a, you end up spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get everything back together. Unless, of course, you had them as separate services. But services can be hard. It could be over-architected. And it may not be appropriate. We also had a silly reason of our SVN repository was just too big. So we're like, oh, why don't we split it? So it was kind of sad. We split all of these up. But then in the end, Everything depended on the same thing. Everything was the same deploy. We spent a lot of time writing a bunch of scripts to allow people to check out all of the repositories, update all of the repositories when they made a code change because it would be checking several things. And we ended up building an entire mess of tools that smelled like unicorn. So I don't know if anybody's had um, you know, the opportunity to work in like developer tooling. But 
it is so easy when you're writing a tool to just be like, oh, I have this code base already. I'll just add more stuff in there. Let's just keep adding more stuff. And that ends up complicating the interface for your command line tools. People get confused. And then eventually one day, everybody forgets what the thing actually does. They're just like, oh, well, when I walk in in the morning, I type this command, it gets me code. When I finish a change, I type this command, and it pushes the code up there. And meanwhile, this thing has grown so mammoth that if there's an error in there somewhere, nobody knew what all the steps were anymore to actually put it back together. And their thing screwed up. And now you have to waste the time of all of the senior people that might know it. Instead of letting them work on features, they get to be tech support for everybody internally. So not sure if anybody follows our Codus Craft. We are an open community about what we do. We uh, have a GitHub repository. We try to open source as much of our stuff as we possibly can. We have StatsD, we have AB frameworks, we have testing extensions, Jenkins plugins, uh, just to name a few. Um, and we also have our Codus Craft blog where we talk about uh, different problems that we have run into and how we solve them. Because, well, this, why not? Everybody else shouldn't have to make the same mistake you did. I mean, learn from us. Um, one thing I think about is uh, the, I guess it's a proverb or saying that is, uh, a stupid man is someone who makes a mistake and just keeps making it. A smart person is somebody who makes a mistake and learns from it. And maybe you might get to the third level, which is a wise man is somebody who learns from other people's mistakes as well as his own. And for the most part, all of us are smart people. We're looking for smart people. And we're going to make mistakes, right? <laughs> and those mistakes are learning opportunities. They're not, you know, something to be overlooked, something to, you know, make someone feel ashamed of. It's a chance to be like, oh, yeah, I guess we shouldn't have done that. And this is why we shouldn't have done that. And in the future, if we run into something like this, we won't do it again, hopefully, as we always forget sometimes. Um, so anyways, our SVN to Git move was for a few reasons. One, we had a bunch of Git SVN fans. And so if they were using that tooling on top of SVN that had a whole rat's nest of things that could just fail, and then Git SVN was flaky on top of that, how much time do you think they spent debugging their process over debugging their code. And that's just ridiculous. Um, Git was also better equipped to handle the mammoth repository. Um, though I do have a funny story if anybody wants to know how you can use Git and Jenkins to DDoS your network. It's kind of fun. You know, it, it's really hilarious, you know, having the late night of moving the code over and then getting a, a page being like, hey, uh, you're taking down the site. I only touched the test stuff. Like, how the hell is that taking down the site? OK. But you never arg argue with somebody who's telling you to take the site down, right? Always answer the call. And uh, so I also remember a couple of the, the older gentlemen. You know, Everybody's always got to have the angry old dude, right? You know, this is like, in my day, you know, oh, I went through this, and it was awful. And uh, we had the guy that was just like, you can't take us off of SVN. Productivity will come to a halt. And I was just like, dude, they're both version control systems. Let's just map out you know, SVN to Git, do this little thing, you know, teach people, show them. Is, guess what? They want to get their stuff done. They have incentive to get things done, right? And uh, next day, we actually, I think, pushed out more than the day before. So, you know. To hell with it. So, how are we going to uh, deal with teams? It turned out that, well, or at least what we're trying out now, is the idea of a uh, customer base. So, the idea being that just dividing people on arbitrary terms, putting them into arbitrary repositories, is kind of silly. Um, but if you're dividing it based on, like, what are techn is there a technological difference? Of course you can put that in a separate repository. Like putting Solar in its own repository, it's all Java. It doesn't directly interact. It interacts 
via you know HTTP or uh, some other um, RPC level API. Um, and uh, the other uh, idea was to break teams up by customer, but not necessarily break up the code base. Um, and the other thing is just you know making it easy to change teams. Um, as of like this week, I went and switched from like developer side over to op side, even though I have like no hardware experience. But hey, you know, whatever. We're just like, you know, we really take this DevOps seriously and we're just like, you know, anyone should be able to do anything at any time and we should all learn and respect what each other does. So it's pretty cool. Um, so we broke up by customers because our site kind of have two different, two external customers. We have sellers, you know, we need to provide them with seller tools, with the storefronts, getting their banners, getting their marketing, putting them in uh, search results appropriately. And then we also have the buyers, which have a different focus. Some, I've, I've talked to some people and they're like, you know, I go to the site and I see something that's close, but then I don't get it. And I'm like, why didn't you just talk to the, the seller? And they're like, I don't normally talk. Wait, you can talk to the seller? I'm like, yes, you can talk to the seller, have a conversation, you know? That's the fun part of it. And so activity feeds, the treasuries, if you've gone to the homepage, we have this, 16 by, uh, this four by four uh, grid of images. And people will actually spend all day just going through all of our photos, putting together a treasury to be like, today I'm feeling really blue, so I'm going to put together a blue one. And before you know it, it's appropriate to put this blue treasury on the front page, which is kind of cool. And getting people to spend time, you know, is conversion. The longer you spend on a site, the more likely you are to probably buy something. So we want to engage you. We still keep the core stuff because I mean, APIs need to be available to everyone. Uh, one of my favorite things uh, about going to hackathons for Etsy is most of the times we win. <laughs> like somebody wins with the Etsy API. And I think it's because our sellers just take so darn long with their uh, photos. And it's much better curated photos than like doing you know, Flickr or any other photo sharing. So people come up with really cool stuff. Um, performance, dev tools. Those are things that affect pretty much everyone. Um, and engineering is the customer. So the API people need to make sure that people making a new buyer feature can make the API endpoint for that. Uh, performance needs to make sure that when we uh, change something to like creating a listing, that all of a sudden the sellers aren't spending forever, <laughs> you know, creating a listing. Um, and dev tools, making sure that people can get their code out. Uh, privacy and security kind of in its own place because it's, it's an expertise level thing. I can't even pretend to know everything about security, but I'm sure there's a couple people in here that know a decent amount about privacy and security. And then uh, payments are latest feature. Uh, how many people are sad with PayPal? I'm kind of indifferent, you know. But, you know, we're moving to direct payments because people get the warm fuzzy of, you know, yay, I don't have to deal with PayPal. Yes! But, you know, legal required silo, so we deal with that. So, I'm not sure how many of you have followed Etsy, and I, I'm cutting this portion short because, well, we talk about it all the time. Uh, anyways, we are a continuous deployment shop. We do continuous deployment for a multitude of reasons. Um, one, it is a great retention tool because People love feeling like they're still in a startup. And when you're in a startup, you can just be like, I'm making this change on the web server, and yeah, it's just out there. We're not that crazy. Uh, it goes into version control before it goes to the web server. It does also go to a staging server before it goes to a web server. Um, the other thing is um, it's also a good safety net for us. Um, I'm not gonna say that like QA is the worst thing ever. It's not the worst thing ever, but QA can only catch so much, right? As, as a human, you can only assume the worst so far. 
Um, otherwise, you are probably depressed that you've assumed the worst beyond that. So, as uh, you know, there's only so much you can assume, and what you assume kind of dictates the limits to what you can actually test. The other thing is, how long are you going to test? In the beginning of testing something, uh, you can get a lot of bugs, but the longer you spend testing, the fewer and fewer that you will probably find, possibly because you are getting bored, or you know they're getting harder and harder to replicate. So not that QA is a terrible thing, but having the continuous deployment is a bigger safety net than having a long QA cycle. If we break the site, we have graphs on the forums, so that means somebody's complaining. Forums, you know, they can be kind of a, a sad spot. They can be a good spot. Um, but if all of a sudden we are seeing a lot of uh, traffic in the forums, that kind of means, oh, we probably did a bad push. We, may, we also have graphs on like, what error codes are we sending out? These graphs are, are very important to letting us know what is the health of the site, probably more so than the test because they're, they're general indicators of the health of the system. And so, with having the continuous deployment every 20 minutes, that means if you see the spike within one minute of pushing out, it's only 20 minutes till the next time that you can fix it. That doesn't mean that we have errors all the time. I think, I didn't put out the number, but I think in 2011, or no, it was 2010, we ended up with 571 deploys. And that was mostly just from July until the end of the year, so only half of the year. And we only had six site outages in that whole time. Which, if you think about it, how many site outages have anybody else had in about that time? So, not too much. Um, the other thing is, this continuous deployment goes kind of hand in hand with what our DevOps culture is. Always be pushing, the developer happiness thing, because how many have worked in a software shop where it's like multiple weeks that you have to push? It's a release cycle. And it's getting close to the end of the release cycle. And you're really close to finishing that feature. And somebody goes, no, it's going to have to wait another two weeks. It really sucks. It's a bummer to be told, yeah, your, your feature can't go out for two weeks. And then what do you do? Do you like, you know, sit on your hands and not do anything for two weeks because your feature didn't go out? Or do you go and add more stuff to your feature and lose, you know, you know, what integrity you had in the feature uh, that you could have tested out beforehand? And so we don't want sad developers, so we do that 20 minutes. Oh, you're done with your code? Get in line. Go on the IRC channel, tell everybody, hey, I'm ready to push out my code. Push out your code. The other thing is, uh, it helps us with trusting one another. Trust is very important. Um, as a speaker before had said, uh, if you don't trust to have everybody on your email account, you didn't hire the right people. <laughs> well, if you don't trust people to be working in your code base, you hired the wrong people. You, sh you should trust the people you work with. Um, it creates a better work environment. Uh, I know that when I finally moved into companies that started you know, caring about uh, what product they were working on, it always felt so much better knowing that if I wasn't in the office, somebody was going to take care of it. And that's awesome. Whereas I worked at some companies you know, where you, you know, it was a job. To people it was a job. And when it's just a job to them, they don't care. You're out of the office. Shit hits the fan, and it doesn't get fixed. So always be in an environment where people trust you. Um, our continuity, we always talk about continuous deployment, but this is where I have kind of a beef with it. Uh, <laughs> continuous deployment is the idea that you can push changes to production continuously. It's not the idea that you are continuously testing. It's technically, you can change the code on your server anytime you want, right? Who cares? And actually, it's the easiest thing to do because we all have to have some way to push our code to production, right? Slap one button on it, HTML page, over a bash script, or a Windows script if you are deploying on Windows servers, and 
just push the code out. And it's very nice when anyone can do it. Uh, we have several photos, and I totally screwed up and didn't put them in. Uh, we had one of our VCs push. Uh, we have pictures of dogs pushing code. People bring in their children for, sometimes for children, bring your children to work day, and sometimes just they brought in their children, and they're just like, here, honey, go push the button. Uh, I think uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the head of search, he actually had like his one-year-old baby in and had her like, you know, with her hand on the mouse button to push code out. Um, so I consider that like the first level of continuity that you can possibly get. It's the easiest, it's the absolute easiest. Anyone can do it. Uh, continuous integration, that one isn't too hard either. Um, there's, a, there's a few solutions. I would say a lot of solutions, but most people are like on Jenkins, Cruise Control, maybe still. Um, there's a few others. I think uh, ThoughtWorks has Go. Um, and that's just the idea of being able to apply your quality processes continuously. So anything that can run the tests on a regular basis and give you a thumbs up, thumbs down signal. Technically, you don't even need logging on it, but I would highly recommend having logging just to see, oh, I'm wasting a lot of time on these tests flapping between red and green. Um, and the third one is continuous delivery, which is releasing new features, which is different than changes. That is totally to the level of, hey, I got this new idea. How quickly can I get it out on the thing? Do I need to go through an entire process? Do I need to do the requirements? Do I need to do the, the full spec? Or is there some way to do this? Um, and that one, even I'm questionable about whether or not people can do it. And I would love to see how somebody would come up with an idea to do that. Because the deployment, in the, the deployment got developers and operations together. The integration got developer operations and, uh, and quality together. This last one, delivery, actually would get the designers and product together with development and operation. Now, I mean, our designers and developers, they edit our smarty templates, they push code out, and that's cool, but I still feel like there's more that to increase communication between them. And I, I would honestly love exploring that, and if anybody's got you know, ideas to ever bounce off, please you know, keep in touch. So, I mean, we have developer operations. Hopefully we're working a little bit closer to product. I mean, product can still push out code, product can still edit code, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the developers and operations are talking back to product in the same exact way. So anyways, sorry for cutting that a little shorter than usual, but some things to just think about. Um, Look back on history to avoid repeating the bad parts. I talked about the fact that we had that developer DBAs ops silo system, and then we ended up, again, segregating ourselves only into a mess. And it's something that is kind of hard to get over. Because um, culture, culture is not something that you can just read a book and be like, oh, our company now acts this way. You, you can't change habits that easily. It, it takes a lot of work. So if you do have ideas on how your culture is, work, is supposed to work, think really hard about what it is that you want. Think about what the minimal things are that you can get. And just, you have to keep working. Sometimes it's depressing because all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's an asshole there. But <sighs> fig <laughs> either figure out how to get around it or not. I mean, the, the couple of slides ago, I had the, uh, well, that's the fail one. I totally missed that one. Darn it. Anyways, Ex Libris, the one who did the whole dictionary page with uh, creativity is uh, uh, being able to fail, uh, also had accept, uh, accept what you cannot change and change what you cannot accept. So if, you are in a situation where you're like, it would be really nice if all these people would get along this way. Figure out what you can change, figure out what you can't change, and figure out how you're going to deal with 
keeping what you can't change. The other thing is don't optimize too early. The whole Sprouter incident, that was the idea that we're like, well, we're going to have to grow the database. So if we make a separate database layer that's owned by these DBAs that know everything about databases, they're going to be able to shard, magically shard, and magically cache, and magically grow everything just because it's all behind one interface. And uh, that's not necessarily the case. When you're, even if you're looking at the whole organizational thing, how do I break everybody up into teams so that the director or the VP or the CTO isn't spending all day talking to each 100 people that now works for him and directly report to him? Uh, don't optimize too early on that. Natural leaders should rise. And if they start leading a group, maybe that's the logical idea for the group. Um, don't just you know, force it into groups because you're like, it has to be five to seven. It'll work out. Um, and the other thing is, just keep it simple. Don't make anything too difficult. I mean, we had that whole sprouter thing, then we just went down to an ORM. Even that sometimes gets people a little riled up that that's a difficult piece of architecture to deal with. And really, at the end of the day, it's about making the product and you may think that it's a, the most complex feat ever. It's not. Just keep it simple. Keep everything nice and simple. So anyways, uh, thank you for uh, putting up with my uh, very uncohesive talk. Uh, and uh, visit Etsy.com if you haven't. Uh, we do have Codescraft. Most of the stuff is covered in those articles. Uh, always feel free to comment if you feel like we didn't tell you enough because we will respond and we will tell you even more than you wanted to know. We have the slide shares. And uh, I would love to thank these Etsy shops. Uh, Go Cincinnati, you have like 60 pages worth of people who have said that they own a shop in Cincinnati. That's pretty awesome. And you know, if you ever run into an Etsy seller, reach out to them. They are an entrepreneur just like you. Okay? Any questions? Everybody want a break? Yes. yes. Well, I was going to ask a question. You have stats needed and you collect all these stats and you know, put out all these charts out there. Mm -hmm. You decide what to look at at any given point in time. I imagine there are just so many things. That yeah. Uh, we have, I want to say something like 115 or 119 thousand different stats that we keep track of which is absurd it's really absurd because who, who can even keep track of like a hundred stats I mean look, look at uh, baseball scores and for a player and be like how many stats does a baseball player have how could you even keep track of all of that in your head uh, so we do have a major dashboard uh, that you will look at when you push the go to production button. So you push go to production and it will take you to a page that has what we consider like the top metrics. Are you throwing errors? Do you have warnings? Um, what do the forums look like? How much traffic are we getting in the forums? Uh, if there was something, some other signal that we have found that has bitten us and become very important, it gets promoted. If there's something that has not been indicating anything decent to us, it gets demoted. Uh, we also have a parent to this page which lets you divide off the stats in different ways. So even though we have a hundred and whatever thousand uh, stats, some of those are for specific teams. So like search is very interested in the latency of uh, search results because they have a direct impact on how fast those are supposed to respond. But that doesn't mean that we should clutter the view of just the general deployer with that stat. Um, other people like uh, internationalization might want to know how many people are actually going into their language versus not going into their language. And they would have those separate graphs themselves. Because at the same time, that's not something about the health of the system. That is something about um, determining what to do next with the feature. So some things are features. Some things are health. Um, some things are more important to others, like the DBA is going to be a little bit more concerned with exactly how fast the queries are going, and it's easy for him to then go, hey, I noticed your query is really slow. 
uh, you should probably go look into fixing that. Maybe this idea would be good for you. So uh, certain people have certain stats. Certain stats come to the top. And that's kind of how it works. And of course, uh, we have John Alsbach, who is crazy with metrics and figuring out how to interrelate them. And uh, there's another ops guy, Marcus, who loves his Splunk so much. And <laughs> Uh, they are very excited to start figuring out how to correlate stuff and actually start doing future predictions on uh, when the site might be approaching a bad point. Any other questions? Um, when you separate the buyer and seller team, mm -hmm. and then you have like the core team, does, like if a seller team required a new API, do they make the changes and get it reviewed, or do they put in a request to the core team? Uh, so uh, the seller team should actually write the API endpoint themselves because all of the API infrastructure is there. Um, we do, uh, as of recently, have uh, like a centralized uh, code review tool. It's just GitHub. We create pull requests from branches. You know, nothing fancy. Just to use the inline. And uh, so it is encouraged for them to, you know, send it to the core team to be like, hey, would you not mind reviewing this? But it's not on core's onus to actually write it for them because they know a lot about the API. They can review what are the proper practices for the API. But the person implementing the feature has a better idea of what the use cases are for the feature to actually encode into an API. So um, I have a friend uh, that you know also at Facebook. And when someone breaks the build, it's a big deal, and they mock that person a lot. Um, I'm just wondering, because it, it sounds like you guys don't do a whole lot of that code review, it's you just push your, your stuff right up. H how is that culture? Is it, a, is it a culture of shame, or is it a culture of encouragement, or, or like, how does that yeah. work? <laughs> so our, our big thing is the blameless post-mortem, which sometimes I'm like, you know, this how can it be completely blameless if it's not anonymous? But you know, it's still it's blameless in the sense that we don't look at that as like you're a jerk, put money in the pizza jar or the beer jar or something like that. You know, uh, I think somebody had said that Microsoft had it. If you broke a build, it was like ten dollars into the beer can, and then there, you ended up buying like a pizza beer party or something. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't do that. I mean, sometimes we end up with like funny pictures or funny things that we, we go like, ha ha, loser, you did that. But it's all in good fun. Uh, I remember uh, a couple of our ops dudes uh, were brand new and they were racking a server and they were racked it upside down. So that, of course, is a picture that needed to get shared. <laughs> but for the most part, we do the blameless postmortems because the idea is, Everybody and anybody should be able to get into the room, listen to what happened, what went wrong, what you could have done differently, look at the timeline, and actually you know, get something out of it. Because the first time you screw up you're, ever in your life, you're probably like panicking and going crazy, like, I broke the site, and you waste a lot of time panicking. Don't panic. Calm, calm down. And so it's good to just have somebody that can go through the timeline and be like, OK, it took us this long to figure out that there was a problem. It took us this long to figure out what the problem was. It took us this long to go and recover from the problem. Was there something that we could have done differently so that we could detect it sooner? Was there something we could have done so that we could uh, figure out the problem sooner? Is there something we could have done to recover even faster? And is there something we can do uh, to prevent this from ever happening again? Uh, one thing I have to say, it's my little pet peeve, I have to stick it in. Uh, don't ever just say I have to write more tests. You know, actually figure out what you needed to have a test on. That's what's important. It's what was the specific root cause that you were looking for. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, it could be something that, most times it ends up being like a, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. And that's why it's important that we pull people in, because if you didn't think about it, probably everybody else didn't think about it. So uh, we have the blameless postmortems. It gets posted on a wiki page. People will send out emails. 
even if it's something that didn't hit production and for some reason didn't get deemed high enough of a threat to be a postmortem, people will write really lengthy emails with diagrams and graphs and pictures describing exactly what they did and where they were a boober. And most of the times, uh, people are harder on themselves than they are on each other. And so it sounds cute to do the whole clown nose thing, but it doesn't really do anything for you in the end. Um, yeah, you talked about cross-functional teams that mm -hmm. require um, developers to, to move around or if someone wants to just stay and work on one part of the product for years, you can do that. If, if you are a person that is so happy working on what you're working on, that is awesome because happy people make good things. They come into work all excited, all bushy-tailed, yeah. But the point of being able to move around is enough of us are restless people. Like, we just need to be able to touch something different. We need to know other people's perspectives on things. And so it's important that we make it not difficult to move around. Even if you're going to be leaving a portion where you are like the expert, the dude that knows so much, for one thing, if you feel like you're in a situation where one person is going to make or break you, you got a problem. Like there's, there's definitely more than that one guy that's a problem at that point. Uh, so it's important that no matter what, you should be able to move around if that's what's going to keep you happy and excited and moving forward. So we want happy people. <laughs> so you find that usually people want to move around? Uh, no, I say it's probably. It's probably like 50-50 in a way. Okay. Um, and it's probably more like 90% will stay in their focus area. But now with the focus areas and having all of the different features, we basically have it set up so that like as soon as it's, oh, we want to have weddings available, a certain group of people within buyer would join in and work on weddings. And then another thing might come along, and a couple of those will move off of weddings onto working on the next thing on treasuries or something like that. So sometimes, most times there's movement within the focus group uh, just to get like a different perspective, new feature, because it's always nice to go home to mom and be like, look, mom, I put this up. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over. Anything else?